If you're angry at life, let him know. If you're angry at God, let him know. Tell him, God, the enemy is cancer. I hate divorce. I hate change. I hate being invisible to those who I'm serving. I hate that I can't fix my children. I hate addiction. I hate infertility and I I rage out against it, God. Do something about it. And the beauty of this psalm is that the same God who was there to put his guiding hand of protection upon you is also there to welcome your rage because it's okay. God can take it. If you're angry at life, let him know. If you're angry at God, let him know. It's okay. You know why? He's in it with you. There's something very beautiful about the inclusion of that kind of rage in the Bible because the God who is that close to you, the God who is in it with you, is a God whose holiness can host your hate. God is bigger than your hate. God is bigger than your rage. And the fact that in Scripture we have evidence of the writer calling out to God with this kind of rage means it's okay for you to do the same. Somebody here needs to hear me say, whatever is behind you and whatever is in front of you that is causing you to be paralyzed in your faith, He's in it with you. He's in it with you. And verse 6 continues with the good news. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Are you able sometimes to hear words from a pulpit or from a Sunday school class or from someone who loves you? Are you able to sometimes hear news that is so good that that may apply to everybody else, but it's too wonderful for me? You don't know what I've done. You don't, you don't know where I've been. You don't know who I am. You don't, it's too wonderful for me, he says, It's so high that I can't attain it. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? And then these words, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, the darkest shadowy underworld, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the furthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall hold me, guide me. Your right hand shall hold me fast. Have you ever been in a situation where you just want to run away from God? Or you're at a place where perhaps in your shame or in your fear or just in your, your anger, your rage over the way things are unfolding in your life, you just want to get away from God because you know if you're in the company of God, if you're in the presence of God, then God is going to require something in you that changes or something that has to be let go of and you just want to run from it. The, the psalmist says, I know. But no matter where I run, where can I flee from your presence? I'm trying to get away from you, but I can't shake you. Do you know that no matter how far and how hard you run from God, you can't shake him? Because God is crazy about you. And there's nothing you can do about it. And sometimes the biggest fear we have is not what lies behind or what lies in front of us, but you know where it is. It's over our head. If I ascend to heaven, you're there. What some of us are afraid of is we look up and we see a storm cloud brewing. We go through seasons where we see the clouds fat with rain, dark, and we know at any moment it's going to break open and the rain's going to fall and the flood's going to rise and the wind is going to blow and beat against the house and our fear is what if my house can't take it? If I ascend to heaven, are you there? Some of us aren't afraid of what lies above us, but what lies below us. Does anybody know what it's like to experience the debilitating power of anxiety in your life? Crippled with depression? Because if you know anything about that monster, you know that sometimes the worst fear is that when you look down, spiraling as you may be down deeper and deeper, your fear is that the lower you go, there may not be a bottom to this. How low can I get? And the fear is that I will go so low, I can't come back. If I make my bed in Sheol, 
Are you there? And some of us aren't afraid of what lies behind or what lies ahead. Some of us are not worried about the clouds that are brewing overhead or the bottomless pit of depression that some may experience. But some are afraid because you got to make a choice and go right or left, and I don't know which way to choose. If, if I take the wings of the morning, which way do I go? If I go this way, I may be okay, but if I go this way, I may settle at the furthest limits of the sea and never come back. And yet the psalmist says, no matter where you go, if you ascend to heaven, he's above the clouds. See? If you make your bed in the darkest, darkest, shadowy places, well, he'll make his bed right next to you if you take the wings of the morning and settle at the furthest limits of the sea. Even there, your hand shall guide me. Your right hand shall hold me fast. It reminds me of a song that was on my heart this week. I even heard it being played in one of your Sunday school classes earlier today. The lyrics to to reckless love. Listen to these words. There's no shadow you won't light up, a mountain that you won't climb up, coming after me, God. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. If I were to summarize everything that the psalmist is trying to tell you and tell me about what lies above and below and in front and behind us, it's this, he's in it with you. He's in it with you. And then, how do we know this? We pick up in verse 11. This is why and this is how. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day, for darkness is as light to you. You are not intimidated, God, by the degrees of darkness that my life can see because you know how to walk in the dark. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Incidentally, if I had some time today, you know what I might preach? If I had some time today, I might preach how Psalm 139 has so many motherly images. Here is God hemming us in, knitting us together. And so either either that means that God is a tender, loving, um, motherly figure, or it means maybe I ought to take up some crafts myself. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. And watch this line. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance, not only physically, Not only did God see our unformed substance before it took frame, before it became recognizable, but I read that and you know how I hear it? Before my my substance was formed, before I even formed a way to survive in this world, before I grew up a little bit and got some wounds of my own and learned to put on a certain persona in order to protect myself in this life, before I learned how to protect myself from the shame that I experienced or the fears that I will see in this life, before I have taught myself either in healthy ways or unhealthy ways to deal with the anger that I experience in life, before any of that was formed in me, you saw me. And you still see that version of me that you had in your mind when you thought I was a good idea in the beginning. It continues on. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They're more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. You know that when you're born, a clock begins. You know that there are a number of breaths budgeted in your lungs. There are a number of heartbeats budgeted in your heart. And every one of those breaths and every one of those beats are borrowed from God. And when we come to the end... It's not simply that we come to the end of life before we come to our end, but all through our lives, there are moments when we come to the end of me, the end of 
ego and the end of pride and the end of arrogance and the end of a life that I have built on my own. And when we come to the end of ourselves, the psalmist would say, he's still there. Even when we come to the end of believing in God, I don't know if I so much believe in him anymore. That's okay, because even when we come to the end of believing God, God still believes in you. In other words, he's in it with you. The text continues in in verse, and this is where it gets ugly. This is where it gets uncomfortable. All these sweet, nice things we're saying about the ever-present help of God in times of trouble, and all of a sudden the psalmist says, Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me, those who speak maliciously of you and lift themselves up against you in evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them. I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them as my enemies, and right here, I hope you're as uncomfortable as I am. Why does the Bible have places like that? There are places all through the Psalms, they're called imprecatory Psalms, Psalms where you call down God to destroy all of your enemies. And it seems so not very, you know, Jesus-y to say something like that, and yet it's there. Embedded in the very psalm where we are reminded that you you can't escape God. He's all around you. He's above, below. He's right, left. He's in front. He's behind. And then in the midst of that, the psalmist has the audacity to say, oh, are you that kind to me? Great. Well, let's just kill everybody else. And yet, there's something very beautiful about the inclusion of that kind of rage in the Bible because the God who is that close to you, the God who is in it with you, is a God whose holiness can host your hate. God is bigger than your hate. God is bigger than your rage. And the fact that in Scripture we have evidence of the writer calling out to God with this kind of rage means it's okay for you to do the same, to tell him, God, the enemy is cancer. I hate divorce. I hate change. I hate being invisible to those who I'm serving. I hate that I can't fix my children. I hate Addiction, I hate infertility and I I rage out against it, God. Do something about it. And the beauty of this psalm is that the same God who was there to put his guiding hand of protection upon you is also there to welcome your rage because it's okay. God can take it. If you're angry at life, let him know. If you're angry at God, let him know. It's okay. You know why? He's in it with you. And only after you get that honest with God, that vulnerable with God, can you continue to pray the final verses of this most amazing psalm. Verse 23, search me, O God. I mean, I get it, God. I don't sound like someone that, you know, has been changed by you. I know the hate, the anger. I know, I know. But I'm going to tell you because it's who I am and it's where I am right now. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it with you, God. So, therefore, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me. And then lead me to the way everlasting. Beloved, do you know that that is the only place where revival is possible? Where we come to a place of such candid, open vulnerability before God that we lay our hearts open and say, search me. Test my thoughts. And when we assume a posture of brokenness and humility and yieldedness before him, God is able to do something with us that changes everything. 